Good afternoon. Welcome to Instituto Cervantes Manchester and Leeds. Today we are having the honor to have the ambassador from Nicaragua and I, uh, Giselle Morales, because we are bringing here the, uh, the stories from a very big country in South America, not so too big in the, in the world, but very big is the biggest country in Central America, a, a country where there are volcanoes and a lot of different animals. So I hope and I'm sure you will enjoy a lot because the man who wrote those stories is Ruben Darío. Ruben Darío was a gentleman who went from America to Europe, then again to South America. And in those trips, he always was thinking about Nicaragua and what about the nature and the jungle and the animals that you might find there. So today, tonight, you will enjoy these great uh, stories from uh, Nicaragua. Eh, buenas tardes, soy Pedro Eusebio, el director del Instituto Cervantes de Manchester y Leeds. Y esta noche tenemos el honor de tener a la embajadora, que es la representante de un país que es el más grande de Centroamérica, Nicaragua, pero que si lo miramos en el mapa no es tan grande, es un país pequeñito, pero tiene muchos volcanes, muchos animales, y eso hace que allí surjan historias mágicas. Y un señor de hace más de 100 años, Rubén Darío se llamaba, escribía unas poesías muy bonitas, pero además viajó a Europa, luego volvió a América, y se movió por muchos países también de América. Entonces eso le hizo pensar en estas historias donde aparecen los animales, los coyotes, los conejos, los volcanes, los lagos, muchas, muchas cosas. Así que vamos a escuchar un poquito a la señora embajadora Giselle Morales de Nicaragua y después vamos a disfrutar todos con esas historias fantásticas de esos países de los volcanes donde hay árboles que son tan grandes como las casas nuestras aquí en Inglaterra. Sí, sí, no es una exageración, son árboles más grandes que yo. Y animales también grandes, también muy pequeños, muy, muchas historias. Así que ahora vamos a escuchar todos a la señora Giselle Morales. Muchas gracias y solamente decir que cada mes vamos a tener historias fantásticas de muchos países de América. Esta noche Rubén Darío Nicaragua, el mes que viene tendremos con México, luego vamos a tener con Colombia, con Uruguay, con muchos, muchos países que lo que tienen en común todos es que hablan igual que yo o parecido. Hablamos todos en español. Bueno, buenas noches. Que disfrutéis, chicos. Muchas gracias, Pedro Eusebio. Buenas tardes a todos, niños. Pa eh, eh, padres de familia, amigos. Eh, good afternoon, everyone. Children, parents, friends, all. Um, I am going to say it in English and then I'll ask Pedro Eusebio, I will say it in Spanish. Uh, my name is Giselle Morales. I am the ambassador of Nicaragua. Eh, and on behalf of my, the children of my country, allow me to welcome you today. I feel very privileged that you are here with me and that you will listen and, the re and do readings with us of Rubén Darío. As Pedro Eusebio said, Nicaragua is in the middle of the Nicaragua, of the Americas continent and is known as the land of lakes and, vol and volcanoes. We have 16, 22 volcanoes. And we have the biggest lake in the whole Central America. We are a small country, but we are about the size of England, not so small, <laughs> about the size of, the, of England. So um, just imagine that. So we are, um, but we are also known as a land of poets. 
Uh, and today we are going to read Ruben Darío. He is the most important of all. He was known universally as a prince, a prince of the Spanish language. And he looked like a prince when you see some pictures of him, if you Google them and where your parents see, look for a picture of him, he looked like a prince. Um, so he was born in a very small village uh, in Nicaragua in January 1867. Ooh, long time ago. Uh, not even your grandma, I think, maybe was about to, to, to born. So today we are remember his, his anniversary of, of birth. So Darío uh, traveled a lot and he was an avid reader since he was very, very little. And he started to write poems when he was a child. The people in the city of León, of Nicaragua, uh, where he grew up, uh, thought he was a genius. And he loved, as I said, to read book and had a passion for traveling around the world. He visited and lived in many countries, Chile, Argentina, España, Francia, Chile, Argentina, Spain, and France, but he also once visited London. He published his first book when he was 18 years old, and then he published Azul, and that is his stories and poems when he was 21. And today we are going to read a poem from that book dedicated to a little girl, Margarita, Margarita de Baile. So there is, he always re, was fascinated by fantasy, by magic, uh, by, by stories uh, in the country, but also from all over the world. So in Ruben, in his poem, he sees his stories, there is a lot of adventure. You will find enchanting fairies, elves, kings, princes and princesses, and, 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 and also all the animals that exist in Nicaragua. He also wrote about the volcanoes and about the lakes. He always was chasing music, the sound of the music, and he put it in his books, in his writings. So that I think will make, will awake your imagination and creativity. When I was a child, when I was about your age, I was, I also read uh, my mother at the beginning read and my father used to read Darío for me. And like all kids in Nicaragua, I grew up discovering and reading Ruin Darío and also they make us memorize in that time and recite their poems at the school. And I wish you do the same, but above all, please have fun today. Today we are, hoy, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos en nombre de los niños de Nicaragua y me siento muy contenta de estar con todos ustedes. Nicaragua es un país pequeñito ubicado en el centro de las Américas, de los dos continentes americanos, conocido como la tierra de lagos y volcanes, pero también de la tierra de los poetas. Es chiquito, es un país chiquito, pero más o menos del tamaño de Inglaterra. So, Rubén Darío es el más importante poeta, poeta de todo y en el mundo se le conoce como el príncipe de las letras cantellanas. Él aparece, se parece mucho a un príncipe en las fotos. Nació en una ciudad muy chiquita de Nicaragua hace 154 años en enero, así es que lo estamos celebrando ahora con ustedes leyéndolo. Eh, él escribió sus poemas desde que era muy niño eh, y la gente eh, eh, de, de la ciudad donde él creció, que se llama León, pero no León de España, León de Nicaragua, eh, pensaba que él era un genio. Eh, a él le encantaba leer libros desde que tenía, eh, dicen que desde que tenía tres años aprendió a leer y a escribir y leía con mucha pasión. Y también viajó por todo, por muchas partes del mundo. Visitó países como Chile, Argentina, España, Francia 
e inclusive hizo una visita a Londres. Publicó su primer libro cuando tenía 18 años y después Azul, que es de historias y cuentos y poemas, cuando tenía 21 añitos. Entonces, hoy vamos a leer eh, un poema de, de, de ese libro a, dedicado a una niña nicaragüense, a Margarita. Su, en sus cuentos y sus poemas siempre hay fantasía, magia, y él siempre con mucho eh, música eh, eh, está pre siempre presente en sus poemas, que son historias con a mucha aventura, eh, de, 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 de hadas, de elfos, de príncipes, de reyes, de princesas, de tigres, de pumas eh, y, y, y de los lagos y los volcanes de Nicaragua. Eh, y que estoy seguro que va a animarlos a ustedes su, en su imaginación. Y yo espero, como yo lo hice una vez, que ustedes tengan la oportunidad de leerlo, como lo hacía mi madre, y lo hacen todos los niños de Nicaragua, descubriendo y leyendo a Darío, memorizándolo en algunas ocasiones, recitándolo en las escuelas. Pero sobre todo hoy yo quiero que todos ustedes la pasen bien. Ahora Claire va a hablar con ustedes y les va a contar lo que vamos a hacer. Hi everybody, good evening. My name's Claire Culliford. It's lovely to see you all here this evening. Um, if you can hear me, if you can see me and hear me, would you give me a wave? Hi everybody. Um, what we're going to do now that the ambassador Giselle and Pedro, the director of the Cervantes Institute, have introduced a little bit Ruben Dario and who he was. Today, we're going to read to the children to start with two of his stories, a story and a poem in Spanish and then in English. And when they've listened to the story and poem, I'm going to come back and we're going to do some little activities on the poem in English, because today, obviously, we have a certain amount of time. But you've also been sent the same activities about the poem in Spanish, so you will be able to do those at home afterwards. OK, and at the very end of our session here today together, we're going to have another short poem by Ruben Dario to read to you all to finish. And it's a really nice one to finish a session like this together. So I'll be back in a few minutes. But first of all, we're going to read to you in Spanish and English a story and then a poem by Ruben Dario. We hope you enjoy them. Explico un poco en español. Como hemos organizado la estructura hoy, vamos a empezar con leer a los niños una historia y luego un poema en español y después en inglés de Rubén Darío. Después trabajo yo un ratito con los niños con el poema en inglés y unas actividades para hablar un poco sobre el poema, entenderlo un poco mejor. Y para terminar nuestra sesión juntos, habrá otro poema cortito para terminar. Y las mismas actividades en español para el poema que yo voy a tratar con los niños tienen, me parece, poco correo. Así que esto se puede hacer después de nuestra sesión hoy. Y sin más hablar, empezamos con leer los cuentos a los niños. Os paso entonces a Giselle para empezar a leer. Si le parece que es él. Gracias, gracias Claire. Entonces vamos a leer un cuento eh, que se llama Las albóndigas del coronel. Eh, y dice, cuando y cuando se me antoja, he de escribir lo que me dé la real gana. 
porque a mí nadie me manda. Y es muy mía mi cabeza y muy mía mis manos. Y no lo digo porque se me quiera dar de atrevido por meterme a espigar en el fertilísimo canto del maestro campo del maestro Ricardo Palma, ni lo digo tampoco porque espere pullas del maestro Ricardo Contreras, lo digo porque soy seguidor de la ciencia del buen Ricardo, y el que quiera saber cuál es, busque el libro, que yo no he de irla enseñando así nomás, después que, se me, que me costó trabajillo el aprenderla. Todas estas advertencias se encierran en dos. Conviene a saber que por escribir tradiciones no se paga al cabala y que el que quiere leerme que me lea y el que no, no. Pero yo no me he de disgustar con nadie porque tome mis escritos y envuelva en ellos un pedazo de salchichón con que a Contreras me ha dicho hasta loco, no le guardo inquina. Vamos pues, a que voy a comenzar la narración siguiente. Allá por aquellos años en que ya estaba para concluir el régimen colonial, era gobernador de León el famoso coronel Arrechavala, cuyo nombre no hay vieja que no lo sepa y cuyas riquezas son proverbiales que cuentan que tenía árboles de oro. El coronel Arrechavala era apreciado en la Capitanía General de la muy noble y muy leal ciudad de Santiago de los Caballeros de Guatemala. Así es que en estas tierras era un reycito sin corona. Aún pueden mis lectores conocer los restos de sus posesiones pasando por la hacienda Los Arcos cercana a León. Todas las mañanitas montaba el coronel uno de sus muchos caballos, que eran muy buenos, y como la escuchaba de magnífico, se la echaba de magnífico jinete, daba una vuelta y a la gran, a la gran ciudad, luciendo los escarceos de su cabalgadura. El coronel no tenía nada de campechano, al contrario, era un hombre seco y duro, pero así todo tenía sus preferencias y distinguía con su confianza a algunas gentes de la metrópoli. Una de ellas era Doña María de... viuda de un capitán español que había muerto en San Miguel de la Frontera. Pues señor, vamos a que todas las mañanitas a hora de paseo se acercaba a la casa de Doña María el coronel Arrechavala y a la buena señora le ofrecía dádivas que, a decir verdad, él recompensaba con largueza. Dijéralo, si no, la buena ración de onzas españolas del tiempo de nuestro rey Don Carlos IV que la viuda tenía amontonaditas en el fondo de su baúl. El coronel como dije, llegaba a la puerta y de allí le daba su morralito a Doña María. Doña María, morralito repleto de biscoletas, rosquillas y exquisitos bollos con bastante yema de huevo. Y con todo lo cual se iba el coronel a tomar su chocolate. Ahora va lo bueno de la tradición. Se chupaba los dedos el coronel cuando comía albóndigas. Y a las becadas, la, doña, la buena doña de María le hacía sus platos del consabido manjar, cosa que él agradecía con alma, vida y estómago. Y vaya que por cada plato de albóndigas, una saya de buriel, unas ajorcas de fino taraceo, una sortija o un rollito de relumbrantes peluconas con lo cual ella era para él afable y contentadiza. He pecado al olvidarme de decir que Doña María era una de esas viuditas de linda cara y de decir Rey Dios. Sin embargo, aunque digo esto, no diré que el coronel anduviese en trapicheos con ella. Hecha esta salvedad, prosigo mi narración 
que nada tiene de amorosa, aunque tiene mucho de culinaria. Una mañana llegó el coronel a la casa de la viuda. Buenos días, le de Dios, mi doña María. El señor coronel Dios lo trae. Aquí tiene unos marquesotes que, deshacen, que se deshacen en la boca. Y para el almuerzo le mandaré. ¿Qué le parece? ¿Qué, mi doña María? Albóndigas de excelente picadillo con tomate y chile. Y buen carne y buen caldo, señor coronel. ¡Bravísimo! Dijo riendo el rico militar. No deje usted de remitírmelas a la hora del almuerzo. Amarró el, amarró el morralito de marquesotes en el pretal de la silla, se despidió de la viuda, dio un espalonazo a su caballería y ésta tomó el camino de la casa con el sangoloteo de un rápido pasitrote. Doña María buscó la mejor de sus soperas, la rellenó de albóndigas en caldillo y la cubrió con la más limpia de sus servilletas. Enviando enseguida a un muchacho, hijo suyo de edad de 10 años, con el regalo a la morada del coronel Arrechaval. Al día siguiente, el trap trap del caballo del coronel se oía en la calle en que vivía Doña María, y ésta con cara de risa asomada a la puerta en espera de su regalado visitador. Llegóse él, él, llegóse él cerca, y así le dijo con un airecillo de seriedad rayando de la burla. Mi señora Doña María, para en otra, no se olvide de poner las albóndigas en el caldo. La señora, sin entender ni gota, se puso en jarras y le respondió. Vamos a ver, ¿por qué me dice usted eso y me habla con ese modo y me mira con tanta sorna? El coronel le contó el caso. Este era que cuando iba con tamaño apetito a regodearse comiéndose las albóndigas, se, con, se encontró con que en la sopera solo había caldo. Blas, ve de mal haya el al... Cálmese usted, le dijo a Rechabala, no es para tanto. Blas, el hijo de la viuda, Apareció todo cariacontecido y gimoteando, con el dedo en la boca y rozándose al andar despaciosamente contra la pared. Ven acá, le dijo la madre. Dice el señor coronel que ayer llevaste solo el caldo en la sopera de las albóndigas. ¿Es cierto? El coronel contenía la risa al ver la aflicción del rapazuelo. Es Dijo este que, que en el camino un hombre que se me cayó la sopera en la calle y entonces me puse a recoger lo que se había caído y no llevé las albóndigas porque solamente pude recoger el canto. Atunante, rugió doña María, ya verás la paliza que te voy a dar. El coronel echando todo su buen humor fuera, se puso a reír de manera tan desacompasada que por poco revienta. No le pegue usted, mi doña María, dijo. Esto merece premio. Y al decir así, se sacaba una amarilla y se la tiraba al perillán. Hágame usted albóndigas para mañana y no sacuda usted los lomos los lomos del pobre Blas. El generoso limita, militar tomó la calle y fuese y tuvo para reír por mucho tiempo, tanto que poco antes de morir referí el cuento entre carcajada y carcajada. Y a fe que desde entonces se hicieron famosas las albóndigas del coronel Arrechaval. Gracias, Giselle. So, good evening, everybody. Good evening, children. So good to talk to children. The ch you are the future. And um, I want to say, first of all, a very quick word. Thank you to Pedro, Eusebio Cuesta, and Carlos at the Instituto Cervantes Leeds and Manchester for organizing this wonderful 
uh, Miss Ruben Dario, one Ruben Dario month. It's gone too quickly uh, in honor of uh, one of the greatest of all poets. And of course, my, my great friend, the ambassador of Nicaragua in London, Isel Morales. Gracias, muchas gracias a Pedro Eusebio Cuesta y Carlos, Instituto Cervantes de Leeds in Manchester, y muchas gracias también a mi, a mi gran amiga Isel Morales, la embajadora de Nicaragua. Nicaragua, he, estado, he tenido la suerte de visitar Nicaragua tres veces en dos años, precioso país, como dijo Michelle, lleno de volcanes y lagos. Um, so I'm going to read my translation, my new translation of Las Albóndigas del Coronel. And um, in two sentences, Darío wrote this uh, story in 1885. He was just 18 years old. And it's a story about a very a well known uh, uh, colonel who actually existed. Joaquin Arichavala uh, was born in Spain and he lived to 95. He went, he was sent to uh, Nicaragua when Nicaragua was still a colony of Spain, of Spain. And he became a very well known figure riding through the land on horseback. And in fact, he was appointed mayor of Alcalde de Leon, mayor of, of Leon in 1790. So he was, a, he was a great character. So I'm going to read my translation now of the story. The Colonel's Meatballs. Whenever I feel like it, I'm going to write what I really fancied writing because no one orders me around and my head belongs to me and me alone. And so do my hands. I'm not saying these things to look daring for covering the same ground as the great Ricardo Palma or because I'm expecting nasty comments from the great Ricardo Contreras, no. I'm saying that because I am such a big fan of Paul Richard's Almanac. If you don't know what that is, go and find a copy of the book. Which I'm not going to start teaching about it now. After all the effort it cost me to learn about it myself. All these observations can be narrowed down to two. You don't have to pay taxes on traditions. Not when you're writing about them anyway. And anyone who wants to read what I've written, go ahead. And anyone who can't be bothered, well, so what? I'm not going to get all upset someone reads my stuff and then decides to wrap a sausage in it. So I'm not going to hold it against Contreras, even if he does call me mad. So without further ado, let me start my story. Now, back in the day, in the dying days of the, colonel re of the colonial regime, the famous Colonel Arichavala was governor of Leon. There is no old woman alive who doesn't know his name. Everyone talked about how rich she was. They even say, the trees in his garden were made of gold. Colonel El Chavala was very highly regarded at military headquarters in the very noble, very loyal city of Santiago de los Caballeros in Guatemala. In fact, there he was a king without a crown. Any reader who would like to see what remains of his possessions can do so by visiting the ranch at Los Arcos near Leon. Now, every morning, the colonel leapt onto one of his many excellent horses, and since he made much of being a magnificent horse rider, he would do a tour of the city, showing off his horse's fine prancing. There was nothing friendly about the colonel. On the contrary, he was a hard, surly man. But even so, there were some people in the town who he took a liking to and honored them with his confidence. And one of these was Doña Maria, the widow of a Spanish captain who had been killed in San Miguel de la Frontera. Well now, every morning, as he was riding his horse, Colonel Arichavala made his way up to Doña Maria's house. The good lady would always offer him a gift, to which, let's be fair to the Colonel, he rewarded her generously. There were a good number of old Spanish coins from the time of King Charles IV that the widow had been collecting in a chest. Now, as I was saying, the colonel would show up at the widow's front door and there Doña Maria would hand him a sack. It was full of biscuits, donuts and delicious buns rich with egg yolk. The colonel took all this away with him and went off to devour it with a cup of hot chocolate. Now comes the good part. 
because tradition is tradition. The colonel's mouth always watered when he knew he was about to eat meatballs. And on occasion, the good Doña Maria prepared him his favorite dish for which he thanked her from the bottom of his soul and his stomach. Plus, for every portion of meatballs, he would give her a dark red skirt, a bracelet inlaid with delicate jewels, a ring or a string of glittering old coins. And she was always very happy to see these and she became very friendly towards the colonel. Now, I stupidly forgot to say that Doña Maria was a good looking woman and well spoken too. Good God, she really was. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the colonel got up to any monkey business with her. No, no. So having made that important clarification, let me continue my story, which has nothing to do with love and everything to do with food. One morning, the colonel arrived at the widow's front door as usual. A very good morning to you, Dona Maria, he said. Top of the morning to you, colonel. Look what I've got for you today. Some sweet bread that's me that'll melt in your mouth. And for your lunch, I think I'll prepare. What will you prepare, Dona Maria? Well, colonel, what would you say to some minced beef meatballs with tomatoes and chili? all washed down with a delicious soup. I would say, splendid, the rich colonel replied with a generous laugh. Don't forget to send it over at lunchtime. He tied the sack of sweet bread to his horse's saddle strap and he bade the, window, the widow farewell. He spurred on his horse, which gave a little shiver and then headed back home with a rapid trot. Meanwhile, Doña Maria looked for her finest soup tureen, filled it with meatball soup, and covered it with her cleanest napkin. And then she sent it over with her ten-year-old son to Colonel Arrechavala's house. The next day, the clip-clop of the Colonel's horse could be heard in Doña Maria Street. She looked out of the door with a broad smile, waiting for her visitor to arrive. He approached and said in a solemn tone, laced with sarcasm, my dear Doña Maria, next time, don't forget to put the meatballs in the soup. The woman, completely taken aback, stood there with her hands on her hips and replied, what do you mean by that? And why use that tone with me? The Colonel told her what had happened as he was about to tuck into the meatballs with his, with his lips spacking, he discovered that the soup bowl contained soup, but no meatballs. Oh, that blast, just wait till I get hold of... Calm yourself, Colonel Achavala said. It's no big deal. Blush, the widow's son appeared, all down in the mouth and whimpering, with his thumb in his mouth and brushing gingerly against the wall as he arrived. Come here, his brother said. The colonel tells me that you brought him only the soup yesterday without the meatballs. Is that true? The colonel could hardly contain his laughter when he saw the young lad's distress. Well, uh, the thing is, I, 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 on, on the way over, um, a man, I, I dropped the, the soup bowl in the street uh, and I, I tried to pick it up and I, but I could only scoop up the soup. You little rascal, Dona Maria Lord, just you wait till I get my hands on you. The colonel, showing all his good humor, started to laugh so uncontrollably that he practically exploded. Don't hit him, dear Dona Maria, he said. In fact, I think he deserves a reward. And so saying, he took out a gold coin and tossed it at the young scoundrel. Make me some more meatballs tomorrow and don't touch a hair of poor Blush's head. And with this, the kind colonel headed back home. It took him a long time to stop laughing. In fact, shortly before he died, he retold the whole tale between one hysterical guffaw and another. And from that day onwards,
ser pues un cuento ya y si pueden por favor Giselle y Adam me encantaría que nos lean el poema que vamos a tratar los niños y yo en nuestras actividades que se llama a Margarita de baile de baile gracias Giselle gracias Claire gracias Adam por uh, esa magnífica traducción que hiciste de, 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 de los cuentos del coronel y la forma divertida con que lo leíste. Hasta yo me lo gocé. Thank you for, because I really enjoy the, well, uh, the way Adam uh, 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 read the story about the albóndigas of the cor of, of coronel uh, Arrechavala. Va, we, vamos a leer entonces a Margarita de Baile. Este es un poema de Rubén y, y que dedica a una niña nicaragüense y que habla de elefantes, estrellas y princesas y, y muchas cosas lindas. Espero que lo disfruten. Es como un cuento pero en forma de poema. A Margarita de baile. Margarita está linda la mar y el viento lleva esencia sutil de azahar. Yo siento en el alma una londra cantar. Tu acento, Margarita, te voy a contar un cuento. Este era un rey que tenía un palacio de diamantes, una tienda hecha del día y un rebaño de elefantes, un kiosco de malaquita y un gran manto de tisú y una gentil princesita tan bonita, Margarita, tan bonita como tú. Una tarde la princesa vio una estrella aparecer. La princesa era traviesa y la quiso ir a coger. La quería para hacerla decorar un prendedor un ver, con un verso y una perla, una pluma y una flor. A, las, a princesas primorosas se parecen mucho a ti. Cortan lirios, cortan rosas, cortan astros. Son así. Pues se fue la niña bella bajo el cielo y sobre el mar a cortar la blanca estrella que la hacía suspirar. Y siguió camino arriba por la luna y más allá. Y más lo malo es que ella iba sin permiso de papá. Cuando estuvo ya de vuelta de los parques del Señor, se miraba toda envuelta en un dulce resplandor. Y el rey dijo, ¿qué te has hecho? Te he buscado y no te hallé. ¿Y qué tienes en el pecho que encendido se te ve? La princesa no mentía. Y así dijo la verdad. Fui a cortar la estreña mía a la azul inmensidad. Y el rey clama. No te he dicho que lo azul no hay que tocar. ¡Qué locura! ¡Qué capricho! El Señor se va a enojar. Dice ella, no hubo intento. Yo me fui no sé por qué. Por las olas y en el viento. Fui a la estrella y la corté. Y el rey dice enojado, un castigo has de tener. Vuelve al cielo. Y lo robado vas ahora a devolver. La princesa se entristece por su dulce flor de luz. Cuando entonces aparece sonriendo el buen Jesús. Y así dice. En mis campiñas esa rosa le ofrecí. Son las flores de las niñas que al soñar piensan en mí. Viste el rey ropas brillantes y luego hace desfilar. Cuatrocientos elefantes a la orilla de la mar. La princesa está bella, pues ya tiene el prendedor en que lucen con la estrella, verso, perla, pluma y flor. Margarita, está linda la mar y el viento lleva esencia sutil de azalar tu aliento. Y que lejos, ya que lejos de mí vas a estar, guarda niña un gentil pensamiento del que algún día te quiso contar un cuento. Muchísimas gracias, Giselle. Muchísimas gracias. 
hermoso, dijiste. Ah. Hermoso poema, sí. Margarita, Margarita de Vélez era la hija del íntimo amigo de Rubén Darío, un doctor, un médico, Luis Henry de Bell. Y, y, y Darío escribió ese poema para la hija, para Margarita, en, en la isla de Caragüense, el Cardón, en 1908. So she was, Margarita de Bell was the daughter of Darío's great friend, very close friend, the doctor, his doctor in his last years as well, Luis, or his last year, Luis Henry Le Bell, and um, Darío wrote this poem on the Nicaraguan island of El Cardón in 1908. To Margarita de, ba de Baile. Margarita, or I should say, sorry, I, I, uh, for, the, for the conversation afterwards, I rhyme, I keep the rhyme in, uh, in the English translation that is in the original Spanish of Darío because it's, I want to keep the sound and the music of the original as I do in the rest of my other book, the poems in my book, which we launched uh, last week and this week. Thank you so much again for the Institute of Cervantes. Margarita, to Margarita de Baile. Margarita, how beautiful the sea is, still and blue. The orange blossom in the breezes wafting through. In my soul, I hear a skylark singing. It has your accent. Too. I'm going to tell a story, Margarita, just for you. Once there was a king far, far away whose palace was built from diamonds and a tent made of day. He had a herd of elephants, huge as titans, a kiosk of pure malachite, a cloak of gold lame, and a princess just as bright and beautiful, Margarita, as you are today. But one evening, the princess saw a star glittering up high. And of course, being ever so impish, she wanted to bring it down from the sky. Her idea was to use the star to decorate a brooch with a pearl, a flower, a feather, or even a poem. Beautiful princess, you see, are really just like you. They cut down roses, a lily, even a star. That's what girls do. So across the sea, this little girl flew far, far up to the moonlit sky and all to cut down the dazzling star. So brilliant white, it made her sigh. She headed up on her mission past the moon. And here's the sad part. She hadn't asked her father's permission. He'll be so worried. It'll break dad's heart. When she finally made her way home, after coming so close to where Dodd, God dwelled, it seemed she was wrapped in a splendid glow, which blazed and flared and sparkled and swirled. The king asked her, where on earth have you been? I've been looking everywhere for you. And what is that partic peculiar gleam on your breast? It's spreading all over, too. The princess found she could not lie. In fact, she told him the truth to his face. I went to cut down my star from the sky, pulling it away from that vast blue space. But the king said, where are your ears? I've told you, you must never touch that blue. You must be crazy, you and your ideas. God is going to be so cross with you. I didn't mean to, she replied. I, I didn't plan it all like that. But, but the wind took me over the waves on the tide and up to the star and I hacked and I hacked. Her father answered, his face black with rage. You need to be punished for all that is holy. Fly back up and return the star back to the very place where you stole it. So, st so sadly did the princess stare down at her sweet flower of light that suddenly Jesus Christ was there. He told the king with a smile, sweet and bright, it was I who gave her that rose, those pearls. All the flowers in the fields are mine. I put them there for little girls to think of me when they dream at night. The king puts on 
a dazzling new gown and merrily orders all 400 of his elephants to march up and down by the sea. Their happy hooves rumble like thunder. The princess is even more gorgeous than ever because now she is wearing the brooch, you see, with its shimmering star and the feather, the flower, the pearl and poetry. Margarita, look how beautiful the sea is, still and blue. Your orange blossom breath, like the breezes, blooms too. Soon you'll be far away from me. But don't forget, little one, good and true, the day I told this story just for you. Thank you so much, Adam. I don't know about anybody else, but I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed your rendition of the poem. Beautiful in translation, but all the more beautiful when you read it the way that you do. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. I'm sure all the children that I can see across the different screens, staring at the screen like me, um, enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much indeed. It was beautiful. Just to check and see, all the children I can see across the screens, are you still there with me? Will you give me a wave if you can see us all still? <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous. What we're going to do is we're going to take the last poem that Adam just read there in English and Gazelle read in Spanish and we're going together to do a little bit of work with that to see what you remember, what you understand, and so that when you go away from that poem, it's one that you can take away, especially from this session together, because it's one of the most beautiful that Ruben Dario wrote. I think, just to check, that the Cervantes Institute have sent out to everybody a little document with some activities in. Can everybody again wave or put their thumb up if they've got that, especially those with children? Fantastic. Then what we'll do, I'm going to go through the activities with the children one by one. It's just some small questions. And what I thought we could do is, if I ask the question and give the children and maybe the helpers, the parents, some time to work out the answer then i'll ask it again and if you want to put your hands up so i can see you i can choose you by name and then i can get answers from everybody who's involved and who's doing the activities with us so that you can participate in the event does that sound okay give me a thumbs up or a wave if that sounds okay i'm seeing two thumbs up from one person here fantastic okay to start off, with I'm aware of time at the moment, so I was going to stop maybe and ask what the individual words meant, but I'm aware of timing and obviously us sticking to our schedule a little bit. So there's the opportunity, obviously, children, for you to work with mum and dad or your helpers or indeed your teachers that I can see there to make sure you know what the meanings of those words that you've just put into the poem are white, blanco, sky, yellow, all of those words, okay? And I know that some people have mentioned they are there with secondary school classes working on this poem. So obviously, although these were activities were designed for some of the younger children, there's a lot more can be done in terms of talking about the symbols that appear in the poem that relate to Ruben Dario's writing and Nicaragua as a country um, and hopefully some of the activities today and the readings of the poem will be a lovely introduction to delve more into this poem and some of his other stories. Um, thank you so much indeed for letting me partake and have fun with everybody here doing some activities about this beautiful beautiful poem. I'm um, somebody who writes stories for children and I started off like this, reading poems and stories when I was really young and your age. So I'm hoping that by doing this, maybe some of you might be inspired and grow up 
to think about writing stories for children when you're older as well. Um, have a lovely rest of day and I'm going to pass you back to my colleague Giselle, can I pass you back to, to you before Pedro maybe to finish up? That'd be okay. Uh, gracias, Claire. Thank you, Claire, for uh, helping us today to guide us today and and, and um, helping the children to discover a little bit more and to play with the words of Darío. Um, that's what uh, what it, that's what is the most important part to play with the words. That's how you create things, playing with words. Um, uh, gracias a todos por, por, y a Claire por, por acompañarnos hoy y ayudarnos a jugar con las, con las palabras de Rubén Darío. I uh, want to thank you to, before I go to my, to my, to, to, to the last poem, I uh, want to take the opportunity to thank you all for being here today, uh, to thank you Pedro Eusebio, Carlos and the staff of Cervantes uh, for um, organizing this to all the participants uh, and in this, uh, we had four events organized for Darío to celebrate Darío, different, a launch of a book, a reading of poetry, and we even have a, book, a, 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 a movie, Tierra Solares. So we had a very, complete uh, uh, in different different ways we celebrate Dario from different uh, forms of art. So um, thank you, Pedro Sebio. Thank you to, but above all, also thank you to Adam Feinstein. Um, he did all the translations for the for the reading today for the Margarita, for the uh, Las Albondigas del Coronel, and the last one that we are going to read very short one and he also wrote uh, the, the the book uh, um, a translation of uh, selected poems it's called the Sel Sel Ruben Darío selected poems so I encourage you to look for it and and and, and complete the reading so thank you and um, I think next year hopefully we will have something different to do with Ruben Darío uh, uh, again. Um, also, this, uh, the, 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 el, 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 el verso que vamos a, el poema que vamos a leer, se llama Soneto de Trece Versos. Y, y es muy interesante porque es, eh, Rubén Darío, como les contamos, le encantaba leer. Y una de las cosas que mucho él hace referencias es al cuen a los cuentos de las mil y una noches. Y, y este cuento, él leyó mucho eso, estudió mucho los, a los personajes y eso, y él hace un poema que tiene que ver con eso. Entonces lo leemos en español y Adam luego lo leerá en inglés. El soneto de 13 versos. De una juvenil inocencia, ¿qué conservar sino el sutil perfume, esencia de su abril, la más maravillosa esencia? Por lamentar a mi conciencia quedó en mi sonoro marfil un cuento que fue de las mil y una noche de mi existencia. Gersada se entredurmió, el visil quedó meditando, Dina Sarda el día olvidó, mas el pájaro azul volvió, pero no obstante, siempre, cuando. Eh, ahora, Adam, tú. Gracias, Michelle, thank you. And remember, children, that um, Rubin Dario, he learned to read very early. And one of the first books he read was, was A Thousand and One Nights. And he always loved this book for the rest of his life. These, the fantasies, the, uh, the, the princesses, the kings, the queens, the, all these uh, the bluebirds, all these mysterious creatures that came in. And he absolutely adored. The, and he couldn't stop writing poems based on that or with images out of that book. And this, I think, this poem, just to finish, 
to say thank you to everybody coming this evening and for the, organizing the whole month and for so kindly launching my book. I'm very grateful. Uh, I think that it, it, it's, uh, it's called the 13 line sonnet, children, because normally the sonnet has 14 lines. The famous Shakespeare sonnets have 14 lines, not 13. But he ends up, he interrupts himself. I think that the poet, Rubin Dario, is falling asleep over the book. He's reading it, the, the, the thousand, one of the thousand and one the stories. We call it the Arabian Nights in English, uh, as much as the thousand and one nights. And he's, I think he's reading it and falling asleep in pleasure and dozing off, like the characters in the poem. He, he is dozing off as well. And that's why it's interrupted. So the 13 line sonnet. What is left of the innocence of my youth? Except for the subtle perfume, the essence of April. But what a magnificent essence. As I think back with regret, one tale rings out like marble. The resounding story I used to hear from the thousand and one nights that I will never forget. Jehazada was starting to doze. The vizier was lost in thought right then. Dinazade did not know what day it was. But then the bluebird returned because, however, oh, and yet they're always, oh, when. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. That was great. Uh, I think uh, we couldn't uh, end this month for Ruben Daria as a better way with the children, because it's when you are a, a child and you you get to 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 know and you get passion for the literature, which has so much to offer to all of us, and we keep that for the for the life li for the whole life. So that is the, this is the aim of this series. We want to bring the, the richness of Latin American and Spanish uh, literature, poetry, Roman, everything, and especially for children. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you again, Ambassador Giselle, for this uh, honor to have Ruben Dario with us. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Claire. And uh, I hope I will meet you again during this uh, series. Every month with Claire, we will have uh, the literature for children storytelling every month. Next month, Mexico, and then with other Spanish-speaking Spanish countries. Muchas gracias. No podíamos haber terminado mejor, creo, este mes en honor a la literatura de Rubén Darío eh, con la literatura hecha para los niños. Es cuando somos pequeños, cuando, cuando nos apasionamos por la literatura y por, por aprender y por lo que supone la música de la poesía. Y ese es el objetivo de esta serie. Por eso espero que les haya gustado, que hayan disfrutado y les esperamos en los encuentros que cada mes vamos a tener dedicados a la literatura infantil de un país hispano. El próximo mes será la vez de, de México. Así que hasta pronto, muchísimas gracias y ha sido un placer, realmente. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Gracias. Muchas gracias.